may see some computers, that's good. So we want to try to do some programming work with you together. In the beginning to my first, so I'm Stef Cooks from Slockit, this is Simon Jentsch also from Slockit. And today we want to talk with you about Intune, our Intune protocol and the minimal verification client Intune, which is the small, smallest client for Ethereum and other blockchain services in this time available. And today I will give you a short introduction how the system works and then we will have time to do some real programming together with Simon. He will show something and then you can also practice it on your own computer and try out the system. To be prepared for the programming if you want to participate live, it's good to have some software available. The easiest thing would be to use a Docker image. We know the internet is not that great here. So I have some sticks. So if you want to install the Docker image directly on your computer, you can just take one of these sticks. There's the, the complete image or you can download it directly. Okay. Okay, what we are doing today. So in the first I want to talk about the InQ protocol, what it is, how it works, what are the benefits, what are the boundaries, and then we will do some programming. So different platforms, how to integrate the Intune client. And in our second part of the workshop, we will go a little bit more in detail how the proofs we are using to verify the information are working and then do also some yeah, programming work, how, we can, how these proofs are working, how you can do it by yourself. And in the end, we will show how to install in node, that means a node which yeah, connects to the network or which provides the services for the network. Okay, first I will I want to introduce you how does Intune work. So this, when you see this, this is the vision everyone had in the beginning when Ethereum or other blockchains were constructed. We have a decent decentralized network with nodes which are connected directly and we have apps which interact with these clients and access the information of the blockchain. Who thinks that this is the configuration which is working at the moment? At the moment it looks mostly like this. Like this. We have this nice decentralized network, but most of the depths are accessing the information of the blockchain over centralized nodes. These centralized nodes are very important for the time now to build these apps. But when we think to the future, we need a decentralized way to access the information from blockchain. So when we talk about clients, then we have different types of clients. So this is an example of Ethereum. For other blockchains, it's almost the same. We have these full nodes or even archive nodes, which are very big, need a lot of resources. And then even if we have a pruned full node, it's way too big to run it in a browser or run it on an IoT device. And even light clients are way too big to run it on, on an IoT device, for instance. So the minimum configuration for a light client is a computer in the size of a Raspberry. But most of the IoT devices are way smaller. So we have to mm -hmm. So when we designed the system, we had something like this in mind. Yes, you cannot see it much because this is a small microcontroller. This is a microcontroller which is built in in a door lock or in other IoT devices. And of course, such a microcontroller is not able to run an IT client at all. And what are doing the most? They are using remote clients, meaning they have a, a node running in the internet and they have a remote connection to this. But with this approach, we are not 
disinterest in water, we rely on disinterest node, and we have a single point of failure, and we don't know if there's maybe an attack in between. So in our solution, or our approach, is the incubed client, which is, so we want to have the abilities of light client, and the security of light client, but the smallness and the easiness of remote client. And I will now explain how this system works. So, before I start with this, now with Incubed, we are able to have a complete decentralized system. That means we have devs which run such Incubed client, and these clients are connecting to a decentralized network of such Incubed nodes, which are also nodes of the decentralized network of the blockchain. So I, want, I will use the term minimal verification client several times. That's why I want to give you a short definition what we mean with such a minimal verification client. So this is a client which is able to verify the information it receives and to validate that this information really belongs to the blockchain. And then it's a very small client, means only a small amount of resources, has only a OPC communication, and which is also an interesting part of the concept, it doesn't depend on a special blockchain. Of course, we did it for Ethereum, because we are coming from the Ethereum world, but it can work the same manner also for other blockchains. And the very important thing is, that this client is a stateless client. That means, to no time it needs to synchronize with the information of the blockchain. So only when we need information, we can connect to this network, and then we get the information, and if we don't need information, we don't need to be online. So the center of the Intube system is the or the Intube registry. That means we have some nodes, these are full nodes, maybe archive nodes, with additional piece of software, the Incube node software, and these nodes register to a smart contract, a registry contract. They give a deposit, security deposit, I will explain it later why we need this, and give some information. So and then the clients, they can get this list, and with this list they know which nodes belong to the network. And then they can interact with these nodes. So, and how does it work? Let's start with one client. And this client has this list of possible nodes. So in this list, it knows how to access this node, it knows the security deposit, and it has a kind of reputation system. So for instance, if it knows, okay, this node is not entering, then it will be blacklisted or in some way. So, when now the client needs information, it can access this list and selects one of these nodes. In this case, it selects node B and sends an RBC request. So I want to know, for instance, if I have access to this, uh, or to this dialog. And it receives the answer, yes or no, or whatever the answer is. So this is the same thing like a remote client would receive. But additional to this, we receive the Merkle proof for this information, and we receive the block header. So and with this information, the client by itself can validate, okay, this information I received belongs to this block. But so at this point, we don't know if node B maybe did send us a manipulated block. Right? We know this block and this information just belongs together, but if this block really belongs to the blockchain, we don't know. And that's why we also send validation requests. So we, we select other nodes from the list. So this is all done only by the client. The node has no influence on this. So and, and then we ask node B, in this case ask node A and also node C, that they validate that this block really belongs to the blockchain. And we get this validation by getting a signed block hash 
So why we use the block hash? Because the block hash is the only information we can validate in the past on the blockchain. So it means, remember this smart contract, the registry, all these nodes are registered in this registry. And now, with this information, we can go to this registry and can check if this block hash, this like block is really the correct block hash. And if we find that one of these nodes is not responding correctly, meaning that he assigns the wrong block hash, we can convict him and throw him out of the list and get his deposit. So this is done, we call it virtual watchdogs. That means if one of these nodes sends wrong information, he loses his deposit, and that's why this deposit is important, and he is thrown out of the list. So, and with this, we have, or we know exactly with which security we can trust the answer. So, and now, with all of these informations, we get the Merkle proof, the block header, and the side of block hash. We can validate that the information really belongs to this block, and this, that this block is part of the blockchain. So, additional to this virtual watchdogs, of course, we could also run active watchdogs, which is an additional security property. So, we can run a client which acts as he would be only a client, but he has connection to blockchain. And then, if he finds one node which answers or gives him the wrong answer, he can directly convict him in the registry. So why is this so important? So we want to have a security so that when I as client ask for information, that I can rely on the information. So and when I get information with all of these proofs, then I can be sure that this information is secure. Of course, I'm only secure in the amount of the, or of the, in the, the deposit which this, these nodes did in the registry. So for instance, if these nodes made a deposit of one eater, then I can be secure. They will not risk to lose his, this deposit and give me a wrong answer for, for, for a request which has a, a lower worth. For instance, if I send a transaction to pay for energy, which is the worth of one euro, and I know the system here has a worth of 10 euro or more, or more, and it can be secure. If I would open a door to a, a very expensive apartment, of course I need a high deposit to be secure that these nodes are not trying to betray me. So at, th at this point, we see that the only thing the nodes can do are answering correctly, or if they answer in front, then they lose the deposit. So this is, is not a good incentive. Hmm? Uh, I'm not sure it does. Can the bot stop see what the client is requesting? Like, how can someone else check uh, a claim by the by the nodes A and C if they don't see what uh, what the client is asking for? So you you ask the, if this node. Like, so the client will never know whether the answer is correct because it cannot check it. So for for it, be able to check it. The watcher needs to see what the client is requesting. So the, the watchdog in this example, of course, he, he cannot check it directly. But for instance, <laughs> if I have a door lock or I have a complete hotel with a lot of door locks, then I can install a watchdog which asks the same question as the normal door lock would do and randomly <coughs> picks nodes in the network and, and asks them. So that these nodes, they, are, they do not know if this is the client which is the door lock client, or this is the watchdog. But they would have to pay for it. Yeah. Yes. The watchdog is costly. So of, of course, it, it's not for free, yes. It, it, it would cost me something to make this request. And could I just ask the same question that the, that the, the light client, the, the Yes. Again, yes. with another node that is connected to yes. so double the cost. Yes. But uh, into the same node. Yes, I, I, I could do this. Yeah, but it's still, I think that's still a problem. Okay, let's get to the I think the important part here is also, um, yeah, in the end, 
what it, what it comes down to is just a block hash. Because everything else we can verify. The block hash is the only information we cannot verify intrinsically. Meaning we have to rely on signatures from the outside. And that's exactly what the watchdog is doing. He's just checking for block hashes. Because node A and C are only signing a block hash. They don't even know the request. They have no idea what they have. It's, node B is simply asking, please sign the block number X. And, this, and that's why the watcher can make sure that they will never sign something wrong because they will convict them right away. And they will lose the those. But do they have to publish these signatures publicly? They don't, indirectly they do because they send a transaction to the contract and convict them. Oh, they do that? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know. So, and, and because that's why they lose the deficit. Because we can convict them directly on chain. So when, when I, as an incubate client, ask node B to ask node A and C, yeah. what they will actually do is they will sign that block hash on chain. Right. Because obviously node B cannot fake the signature from A and yeah, C. That, that's, of course. That's that, why they... That's what the watcher can look at. Yeah, exactly. It doesn't have to pay, it doesn't have to do its own request, it just right. says what node A and C are signing on the block. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. When you send the deposit on chain, then you know the public key, then you know what A and C is, the signature is the public key. If you say sign something, you can recover it, you can recover the public key, yeah. then you know that it is from them. But you have to know what they say. But you know what they say because you get the block, the block hash you get back from the node, right? Like you just take the same block hash you get back because it's part of the block header. So if you get yeah. Um, if you get from node B the block header, you can use it, apply it to node A and C, you know what the public keys is because you recover with a block hash yeah. signatures from these two and then you just look up yeah. in the registry. Oh, does the recovered signature correspond to the entries in my registry that I pulled for? Yeah, I mean, we, we will do this practically then. We can look at the proof, we can do even the manual note to prove that and see exactly what you're doing. Because in the end, it's it all comes down to the block hash. Because the, the, it, it actually, note B will provide a block header, yeah, yeah, yeah. and by the block header, it doesn't mean anything if, if you don't even show the hash is correct. That's why ANC need to sign it. So, one, uh, so the initial list of nodes, which is one chain, how is the cube client pulling that without having a fixed first yeah. node? So in the beginning, yes. The, the first, uh, it was on the slide of the registry. So the, in the first instance, of course, it has a set of boot nodes. And then it has asked, it has asked his boot nodes for the list. If he has the list, then he can ask for the boot nodes with this mechanism all the time. But in theory, this boot node could be, like, since it's a smart contract, it could be a FUBA. Like, if I would want to, I could, it could be a yeah, in fact, that's why, of course, there are some default nodes. As even if you start a parity or guess today, there are some default peers that you start with. But uh, if you don't trust them, you can configure them. Okay, so now, so we discussed that we have these nodes, they have to give us the signed information. If they are wrong, or give the wrong information, they can lose the deposit. So there's not a good incentive for people to run such nodes, right? If I, if the only thing is to do some work and lose some money if I do something wrong, it's not the best incentive to run such a service. That's why we also built an incentive system, which means if the client asks for a validated information, then it pays a very small amount of money to these nodes for getting this information. This actually is not really a micropayment, it's a nano payment, it's a very, very small amount of money. So we have some models, so I will not go in more detail in this session here. So, the, but the information here we can give you later. So that, that we can do some different incentivation models. Could be an infrastructure incentivation that we give reputation for answering good or it can be a monetary incentivation that we give such a micropayment. And with this system, we can build an ecosystem. So the nodes, they run, they give good information or signed information and receive some money in, uh, in exchange for this good information. So as I said in the beginning also, that this client doesn't need or is not only able to talk with Ethereum, it can of course talk with several blockchains at the same time. Because this client never stores some state, it's not synchronized. So with the same interface it can for instance talk to public Ethereum 
put her to any other Ethereum base or even other blockchain. And not only this, also all data services which can give us a proof that the information is correct can be included in this protocol. For instance, IPFS and also other protocols. So, as I said, we have different implementations. There is a TypeScript implementation which is good to be included in websites or in mobile applications. And we have also a C implementation which is small enough to run it on such a microcontroller. And there we have several implementations. There is the Nano Edition which can do only the validation of transaction receipts. This is the smallest edition and the full include client, it has its own EVM and can do even interactions with smart contracts so that we can run the code in our own EVM. Okay, at this point, are there some additional questions? Some of the questions we already discussed, yes? So, what can the Enqube client ask the node to be actually? So, would it be give me the hash or would it be this RPC request to give me the answer? You can ask all the RPC requests, you could also send to a remote client. So, basically, it's like yes. the same RPC interface yes. you have for. Uh, yes, it's the same RPC additional with the information we need for the Enqube protocol, means so the validation requests. But otherwise, you can use the complete RPC request. Uh, is the RPC request specific to your implementation or to the application? No, it, it's exactly the same. Plus additional parameters. Yeah, there's just one additional property. Anything else is just exactly the same. And this additional property is in the, in the, for the request, it defines exactly what kind of proof, what kind of signatures you have, and also the response contains the proof. But anything else is exactly the same. Standard chase obviously is below. We go into the later part of the session over the part like if I ask, get me like I do an ECH call, I want to say get some state from a contract, how you prove that this response actually corresponds to the real exactly. state of stuff. So that's the same. I will part. go into the, exactly these details, how we do the proof, because that's a very interesting thing um, to figure out to verify each detail of the opposite response. Okay. Any other questions? Otherwise, yeah, that's great. Maybe you just mentioned the, e the EVM there, like no EVM and EVM. Like how much, how much do you find like the EVM that's not actually being, being a fact? Like in the hardware, like how many of the actual hardware do not have EVMs? So is that like a big problem? Is it a small problem? You mean how big is our EVM or? No, like uh, the actual deployments with like our pieces of hardware, like how many actually do not run an EVM? So. so it depends what you want to do with this client, of course. So if you only need some information on the blockchain, you don't need EVM. The EVM you only need when you want to interact with smart contracts. But so you want to read any storage data? The, the storage data you can read without the EVM. Well, well, but there is no API for that, right? So yeah, I mean, make a, the F call to read anything. And the F call I only know is true if I have an EVM. Right, exactly. That's why we have the EVM implemented. But of course, you can call these get storage red <laughs> if you know what you're yeah, doing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Um, but um, for ETH call, that was the reason why we started implementing the whole EVM because the only way to verify exactly. that this is correct is if you, first of all, have all the storage values and then verify all the workflows from them and then execute the code directly inside the Ingrid client. Yeah, that seems very heavy to me, but I, I don't but know that's why I asked you. It's not heavy, and that is heavy as you think. Um, because at least this chip can do it. And if this chip can do it, your computer can do it easily. Yeah, yeah. So, so what, what is the chip? Um, this, has, this, this chip here, it has 256 kilobytes of RAM. Yeah. So which one is it, ESP32? It's an NIF a Nordic semiconductor. Oh, yeah. And this means we have one megabyte flash, and two, this is usually the, the, the biggest limit to yeah, RAM. Yeah. Uh, and usually the, that's why the biggest issue is getting the code inside the RAM. Because you need to download the code on a smart contract before you execute it. So if you have a huge contract, you might have an issue at least on very small devices. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Now, now I
Simon, Simon can take over. I need something to hold it. Oh. Hold it. Okay. Maybe I can hold it too. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, should we? Okay, good. Okay, maybe to introduce myself, I'm Simon. I'm the CTO from Socket. And especially for the InQ project, I'm not only the CTO, I'm also the lead dev, so a lot of, co of the code was written by me. And that's why it's also a piece of lit like my baby then. So, um, in order to get prepared for that, I don't know if, if the ones that want to actually code something, because that's what we want to do here. Um, this is the Docker image. This is a simple image, has all the tool chains that you need to, to, make, to compile some C code to run some Java, but a Node.js and also Java code. <coughs> if you want, you can get ready, or if not, you can also take the USB sticks if this is a little bit too much to download with the internet connection. Because all the things I will show, I will just call Docker run and use the same Docker container so we have the same environment. So we don't have to figure out why something does install on your computer. Yeah. Okay. Um, I will take that will take care that everybody is prepared. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay, while you're downloading and installing the image, uh, I would like to give you a short overview. Okay, why not? Also nice. <laughs> yeah, I think. Because maybe to give you where are we standing today? Just a few weeks ago, what we did is we um, prepared the release candidate one. Is that the final release yet? Because we went to a security audit, and the security audit is not finished yet. Okay, that's why we're going to have a productive release as soon as it's finished. But we already published everything, and so it's ready to be used, to be tested. And we also would like to invite you to do this, to um, test it out, try it out, and see how it works for you. What we have here is, if you want to go on GitHub, you will see a lot of repositories. I just want to shortly explain a little bit what you can expect, what you can see there. The first thing is, as Stefan mentioned, we have two implementations. The TypeScript implementation is, was the first one we did. Actually, about a little bit over a year ago, we started with the TypeScript. First, and more like a feasibility study, can we really verify everything? And we can, that's why that okay. Works great with TypeScript, but of course, TypeScript is not gonna run with the microcontrollers, that's why we said, we need a special implementation for the microcontrollers. And of course we thought about how, what, what kind of language are we going to use it. Of course I would, I would have loved to use Rust or something. But if you look at the industry today, all the people that are building stuff on, micro, on IoT devices, on microcontrollers, all the tool chains and all the environment is written for C. If you write something in C, it will run everywhere. That's why, especially also we did some tests, you can get very, very small binaries out of C. So, so that's why we ended up implementing the whole thing in C as well. That's why it has one repository, it's just iDream. Um, it should have been called iDream minus TS because it's actually written in TypeScript, but first we release it under this name. And we have this iDream minus C, which is the C implementation. That's why there are two repositories. And of course, there's one repository that, is, that will represent this node. We haven't talked about this node that will provide the proofs. Yeah? This is the IM3 minus server. This is what we connect to. And then we have two other repositories. The common is more like utils and the default configuration, where also the default nodes, the boot nodes are configured there. Yeah? And the IM3 contracts, this is just one repository where we have all the smart contracts. It's not, they are just actually two smart contracts that really do all the work. But of course, they are very crucial. Yeah. with all the tests and whatever. So this is the code in GitHub. We have two Docker images published. This is the one is the Incube client itself. So if you don't want to install it, you can run the Incube client directly as a docker run command. 
Um, this is sometimes very helpful if you want to replace a light client, for example. You can simply run uh, the, the Docker image, and this will open up a JSON RPC port, and every request that comes into Enqt will then communicate with all the nodes. So it can replace that running client. And of course, the other one is the entry node, which is then one of, uh, one of these nodes. And this is also what we're going to talk about a little later, how you set up a node. Usually, you just run with this type of image. And then, of course, for the presenter for uh, TypeScript, in JavaScript, we have some NPM packages we have deployed. The most important one is the Intune client itself, the, the TypeScript version. And for the C version, we also compile it to Basel. That's why we have a second uh, repository. This is just into Basel. At the moment, it's experimental, but it seems to work very nicely. And actually, it's pretty cool to see if you compare them. I mean, they will both uh, bring the same result. But this one, the TypeScript version, has all the typical dependencies that you all know, uh, all the Ethereum JS libraries and all the stuff. And uh, usually, you have a lot of different node modules. So if you even pack it, it comes down to the size of about 2 megabyte. If you look at Boston, the Boston file is about 270 kilobyte. And everything in there, the complete EBM and all the stuff, and has no dependency at all. So which is pretty cool, especially also from a security point of view. If you think about it, uh, having a module with no dependencies where it cannot mess around with prototypes and all the stuff, really, it's quite helpful. You know? And it's quite fast as well. Yeah, the other one, uh, it's the same as here. We have covered it's just a lot of details, how to serialize, what kind of some transactions and stuff like this. So this is basically what we have out there, and the most important thing is, and if you want, you can also look it up. In Real Docs, we have uh, our documentation there. We try to put in as much as we can, and this information, so hopefully uh, you, you will be able to find almost any answer in there. If not, let us know that we have missed something to document. That's what we have out there when you, when you look for information. It's usually a good starting point to start with the docs. And so it's also explain the concept, just as Stefan explained the background and all the details and even the APIs, references, and all the stuff. Okay. Good. So I don't know if I, are you ready so far to start the Docker image, or are you still downloading or installing? Okay. Maybe we can switch cables now because I'm not going to do this on Stefan's machine. <coughs> The sound is okay. Um, okay. I mean, what? Maybe just give an overview what we want to do because we want to do some practical things. I don't know. The um, Okay, maybe to give you an overview of what we want to do is I want to first show a small example how to use the TypeScript client. Because I think the TypeScript client is targeted for especially most dev developers because JavaScript today is the most used language when it comes to building user interface. There's almost no other alternative right now. That's why if you're building a dev and do not want to rely on the for example, an extra plugin on like, uh, or an environment where somebody checks web three object for you, then you, you would be very interested in finding this. That's why the first thing we we'll just um, do some JavaScript coding, how do you type the client, and then we will um, use the C client. And because even for the C client, there are different uh, targets we compile to. One is like a, just a simple executable, <coughs> that you can even use in a, in a bash script. 
we will play around with that a bit and show what you can do with it. It's actually quite a lot, but you can just in, uh, use in the command line util. And then we will, will look into C directly, write a small uh, sample application in C, how to use the Incube client there. And then maybe also we look into Java, because we all have bindings for Java. Even though the Java client itself will only use the C client and have a G9 interface, but uh, the bindings will have a natural feeling for Java to develop. Why Java? Because especially when you want to develop native Android apps, that's really good to use with G9 interface as well. So you can use it directly on the platform. Yeah, and then in the, in the end, we'll also talk. And what we also want to do is then do a deep dive. And actually think about switching that, if you're in more interested in doing first the deep dive about how the verification work, or do you want to do the practical things first? I don't care. Maybe we'll let's do the deep dive now, because there are already a few questions about that, and I think that will help to understand a little bit more how exactly the verification works. We are flexible. Okay. Um, this is Okay. So, what, as mentioned before, what we what we do is we send RPC request. First of all, this is an important design decision because uh, sometimes people ask, them, "Why do we not don't use the the light client for a call?" Uh, to do it. Well. There are reasons why we don't. One of them is um, these clients, they, they are not only stateless, some of them don't even have a internet connection. Being, using the lifetime protocol means you have to be part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. And this is a requirement we do not have. We don't have, because even this chip does not have an internet connection at all, but we can still use it because we can use, but he has supports Bluetooth, for example. So we can use the internet connection of your phone. That's why we abstracted this transport layer completely, and JSON obviously is exactly perfect for that. Um, this is also one reason why we cannot rely on the P2P network, where you have the uh, requirement to have an active internet connection. So that works also for offline devices. That's important. And the other uh, thing is, of course, usually what you want to do is most of these devices will sleep all the time or door lock, and once you want to open the door, it needs an instant answer. And if you want a like, light time protocol, you will start finding your peers first, that will work. Uh, so that's why you get instant uh, redress. But in order to do this, that's why we have these note lists, so you will know your peers beforehand. That's important. And you know exactly where to send it to. You randomly choose one and say, okay, I want this proof and this answer from you. And that's usually how it looks like. You see, this is a get transaction receipt, a JSON RBC, and here you have this I3 property where we define okay, what kind of verification do we want and the signatures from which other nodes. Yeah? So then you will organize it. Okay, the response looks the same way, you see it gets a result as usual, plus now you see the proof down there. So there are different proofs, I'll talk about it in a minute, what kind, what these proofs exactly are, but an important part of the proof is usually the signatures that were requested, plus then there's another, like this last note list. This is the block number where the last event happened on the registry, meaning whenever a new node was added, this last note list will change, and that's why the client will figure out, oh, it's time to update my note list. Yeah, so that's why, it, that, because the client needs to always be sure that these nodes are still available. Yeah. And, and they still have uh, the amount of positive to do. Yeah, so they that also. The, if they, the exactly, if they were convicted and get kicked out, of course you want to make sure they don't ask this guy anymore. This is not. That, 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 um, the question regarding this aspect. Um, if, I, uh, if I run a node and I deposit 100 ETH, how can I withdraw it? Well, you can withdraw it. 
it, there is a time out actually before you can withdraw it sure. because the, one of the attack vectors would be you can That's give a wrong answer and then withdraw the money. What I'm asking for. So is there when, when the client goes below this, so we have an expiration date for each note? Yeah. No? So when you register, you even can define and say maybe it does expiration <coughs> time out for maybe one day or maybe one hour. You can define that. This is also something that the client needs to consider because if if I'm getting a signature from this guy, I have only maybe one hour to convict him if this is wrong. For other guy, I have a bit more time, so this means I would probably choose somebody who has more time. But the client does have this information yeah. as part of the list. It's part of the, in, of the smart contract of the information, so that he knows exactly how long he could could be. Right. Okay. Now, what I want to explain to this is a little bit more on how Ethereum works internally, because this is how these proofs actually work. Proving the information we get depends on what kind of information we ask. So if we ask, for example, for a block, that would be the easiest use case. If you call ETH get block by number, you get the data of the block header, for example. The block header itself can be easily verified. All you have to do is you take this data and serialize them as a block header. That's the way we do it here. So you just need to make sure you bring it exactly in the right order and, and there are some small things you have to consider. But if you do it right, you can create the data, I'll be encoded, and this byte array, if you, if you hash it, you get a block hash. So this means we can just take the, the data, create a block hash, and then compare it to the signed block hash, and if this is correct, you know the block header data are correct. This is probably the easier step yeah, to verify the block data. Now the next thing is transactions. If we want to make sure the trend, for, for example, let's say we call ETH get transaction by hash, we have the transaction data. We want to now verify that these data are correct. What we need to do is we already have the block header. We also we always need to verify the block header first. And there's one field in the block header is called the transaction root. The transaction root is just a hash, 32 byte. And this transaction root is the root hash of a Merkle tree. Yeah? To be specific, of a Patricia Merkle tree. And each transaction in the block is part of this Merkle tree. And if you want, want to verify it, you need to know the path inside the Merkle tree. And this is the RLB encoded transaction index. You take the transaction index, call RLB encode, and then you have the path inside the transaction tree. Knowing this, now the proof that the, the server will um, give you is just a Merkle proof of, uh, of this transaction. And Merkle proof means it will serialize each node on the way to the, to, to the transaction itself. Yeah. We will have a detailed look then how this actually looks like. But this way, you can then create a hash of all these nodes, and if this hash ends up exactly with the transaction root, you know the data is correct. Yeah. But important is here, again, the transaction data needs to be serialized in the correct way. And it, that's the way you do it. You just take all these values, the nonce, the gas price, to put it in there, use RB encode, and you get the raw transaction. In this raw transaction, you can then verify the road proof if this is this correct or not. The transaction receipt works exactly the same way. So if you ask for a transaction receipt, we, uh, there's a different field in the block header, it's called the receipt route, and then we can verify it exactly. The only difference here is the way we serialize it, here you see there's, a, there's different fields. We have all these events, for example, are all part of this uh, transaction receipt, so you need to serialize them as well. And this code will give you the raw bytes of the transaction receipt, which is then part of this Merkle tree. Then the next thing is if you call ETH get balance, for example or either get storage add or get transaction count. These information, they come from the account object. And the account object 
are verified of, as also part of the Merck tree by the different one. This is the state root. So we have the state root as part of the, the block header. And then you have this Merck tree where all these accounts are stored. So and here, then each account that has four fields. We have the nonce of the transaction count. We have the balance of the account, the storage hash, which is again in the root hash for another Merck tree. And we have the code hash, in case there is code. If there's no, is there no code, then we have always this fixed value for the code hash, which is the, the hash for the empty code. Yeah. So, and if you, so you can now verify that the account data are correct. The interesting part about this is, for example, the, the storage hash that you would need to verify that, did not, at least last year, was not really part of any RPC call. You, you were not able to get this information through RPC. So that was one reason why we said we need another function for that. And this function, that's why we uh, created this AIP for ETH get proof. And I implemented um, a pull request for GET that was a parity. And then they merged it. So it's in there at least for almost a year now. And ETH get proof is exactly this function that will give you the work proofs that you need for that. The other things for the transaction and transaction receipt is something you can build from the existing data. You can just collect all the transaction receipts, create a Merkle tree, and, and get a proof. But here, you need a special function. and This is now in there. And I guess we just need to push a little bit more now to make it official, because I think it's still a draft of the AIP, but it should go through. I mean, a lot of people are already using it. Yeah, once, that's why we have here like two steps actually for the account object. First, we verify the account object, and then all the storage values that you need uh, in, in the smart contract are also stored in the node tree. And this, the root of this node tree is then part of the account object. So you go two steps. Yeah. Here, this is how you uh, serialize the account object, the once balance uh, storage hash and quotation. And ask. You know, there are some some small things that you have to watch out for. For example, if it's a non, if this doesn't exist, that that doesn't mean you get zero out of it usually because you get uh, the empty hash. Then that's why it checks if it's a non-existent one. You do a different kind of proof. Because this was also a challenge there. Um, Merge proofs are great, but the challenge is how to verify if something does not exist. For example, if I call ETH get balance and get zero, how do I verify with a Merkle proof that this is correct? And it works, you can do it, but even with a Patricia Merkle tree, even though it's a little bit tricky to figure out that there's different correlations where you can be sure that this cannot exist because there's some root branches and some branch nodes. If the branch node, for example, leads into a zero or empty branch, then you know it cannot exist there. Yeah, then the hardest one was actually the, uh, the proof for ETH call. Because if you're calling a function, um, you need to execute it locally. There is no way you can simply run a proof on a node and to verify the proof. So what we did here is, the first thing is the node itself needs to collect all the proofs. How does it work? For parity, we used actually trace calls which is quite nice, meaning we asked Parity, give, give us a trace of this call, and, we, and then we went through each opcode and looked whenever we found something that, um, that it relies on some kind of storage value, then we know we need to verify this, meaning we need to create a work proof for the storage value. Or even if, we are, if there's a balance opcode. So, so all S load or all calls to other contracts, we collected them and then created a proof out of this. So then we have uh, at least a proof for all the, the storage values. Plus, we needed, of course, uh, the code itself. <coughs> this is, can be cached at least, so the, the client does not need to download uh, the, cache, uh, the code every time. The code can be easily verified because we have the code hash as part of the account proof. So after we collected all of this, then the client needs to go through 
and execute the code itself. So this means, and that's what this code kind of shows here. What we did, did here is we created an empty worker tree, we created a new EVM to verify, then we went through all the account objects and put these data in this empty worker tree, and after this we created a transaction and ran it in this EVM. And then afterwards we just pick up the result. Of course, it's a little bit simplified, but that's basically what we do. And that's what the TypeScript client is doing. Here for the TypeScript client, we use the Ethereum JS <coughs> implementation. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, but for, for the C client, we had to implement the EVM ourselves. Because this is done the same way. So the client will, first of all, verify everything and then run the code itself. And while running, it also needs to check, for example, if all the values needed are part of the proof. Yeah. There cannot be anything that's not verified. Yeah. Can, you, can you again explain why you are getting the trace from there? Because we need opcodes. We need to know which um, opcodes will be executed when you do this ETH call. So because we need to find the S-load and balance opcodes there. And the ETH call at least makes it easy because you, you get it all in, in one request. And then we can simply find the ones and pick and collect the proof. So for parent, if we get it's a little bit more, uh, a little more difficult because these trace functions that uh, get is currently supporting are only for existing transactions but that are already mined. That doesn't help with each call. That's why what we do at the moment is a little bit slow and because we get the code, we execute the code, and whenever we hit something. And I up code, for example. Then we ask Geth, give us uh, the storage value, and then we collect this, this way. But this means it's, it's way slower, because you need more than one request for getting all the data. Okay. So this is basically also, since the client is completely stateless, you need to know which storage you need to send to the client, right? Yeah, so that's why the node will collect this. It has all the information, but the, the stateless client needs to receive all the information needed to, to verify it within the response. Yeah. That's why, that's how it's called it works. Okay, let's do some, some practical things. I don't know how many of you actually... <laughs> what, what, what I'd like to do is, um, I would like to go to, 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 to many verify just a transaction. I think it's very interesting to do it at least once. I mean, I, ha I had to do it a lot of times when I was debugging all this stuff. You know, something says, okay, the, the hash doesn't match. Nice. <laughs> why? So that's why when you go to the Merkle trees and, and do all these things, but when you do this, you really try to understand how this all fits together. And I think it's very interesting um, to do it at least once here. To, to go through that and to, to actually manually go to a verbal proof and see how this works. Yeah? Okay, um, I want my fingers to throw it. Um, that's not that awesome. Okay, so if you, for example, um, can start the doc, can you, you can also do it awesome. I guess you see you see one screen. If you go to the top, yeah, you can switch to mirror. This, there's this icon that you're tasked by the uh, task at the very top. Which one here? The right, no, for the right. It's left to the left of the people's icon. The problem is your presentation mode. If you have yes, escape, you can go okay, over. Okay, we can escape the presentation mode. Maybe that helps. That looks better. So, so what I just did here, I started the same Docker container that we mentioned here in the beginning. And as part of at least the C client, it was a small util that and this is RLB util where you can simply give it any data and it will RLB decode it. No, okay, pick up. 
even though bigger will be hard because you see, we'll see a lot of numbers. Okay, let's see if we fit in there. Yeah. <coughs> what we can do it now, almost too big. Okay, so. Let's pick some data also to show you how, because this is actually from our test data. Um, let's take, so. This is a, like a request, get transaction by hash, as you can see here, and the result is the transaction data itself, and this is the proof. And now let, let's just go to these proofs in detail, what it is. The first thing that we see here is this proof contains the block header. This is the complete block header that we have here. And if you would take this, I hope you can see this. So this, if I do this, I just did a RLB decode of this block header. And you will see here, see the parent hash, minus state root, transaction root, all these data. And also it will calculate the hash of the data itself. If we look in here, the response had a this block hash. If we compare them, it matches. So we, we know at least this is the block header. And of course, if we have this, the signature for this block hash, we can also confirm it this way then. So now that we know that the block header is correct, we can now go and look at transaction data itself. This is the Merkle proof for the transaction. The first thing we need to know is, if we want to verify the Merkle proof, the transaction index, we know the transaction index is 171, or actually it's also the same number here. It's actually AB. Huh? So now that we have the transaction index, what we can do is, go exactly the same things uh, through what I explained. We start with the transaction root, which is this one, and go now this path. The path itself, we can simply calculate with, no, not this one, this was the wrong hash, the transaction index. So. So this is what you see here. This is the path inside the Merkle tree. Yeah. And now what we can do is we take the first node of the Merkle proof. And these serialize. And what you see here is that's how usually a node in the Merkle tree looks like. This is a branch node, and these are each branch node has 16 slots, you can say, yeah? and these are the 16 slots, and this is the hash of the node. The hash of the first node must be the root hash that's also in the block header. If you look at B5, it's hard to do it on a small screen. We would have here transaction root B5. This is the one, it matches. Yeah? So that's why we know, okay, that's the one. Now we, have, we looked at our path, 8.1ab. So the first part would be here, 8, which is, this is the, the root hash of the next node. Yeah? And if, if we go here, we can now take the next node. This is the next node. This is the hash. And 8 is here. It matches. So this would, I can do this now all the way. And if we look then at the last node, yeah, the last node is a, is a leaf node, meaning this, this is the actual value. 
the right young ones were just a path to it. And this leaf node had the value of this leaf node is here. This. This is a raw transaction. And so I can take now these data from this raw transaction and and compare it to the one we have here, the result. So we have the gas, for example, which is this value, matches. We have the two address, which is this one, matches. And that's exactly what Intuit Client is doing. Very fast to know the proof, just as we've done manually here now, and then compare each data to the response to make sure it's correct. And actually we have a lot of JSON tests that by purpose try to fuss around, manipulate and make sure that it will detect each change. Yeah? Okay, First of, are there any questions for that? How, how this works? How this, I mean we did not invent this mode proof, this is part of the Ethereum protocol, but we are using exactly this to verify the data um, in, in the in cloud. Yeah. Are the RLP message was the message you wrote as part of the contract, or is it a public message? No, it's actually the RLP, because we had to implement the RLP encoding for the C client anyways, and so there was a small command line util that, um, that just. But it's basically existed. part of yours. It's part of you about, about the C client there, but it was quite helpful. I mean, I know Geth also has uh, an RLP decode, I think, or something like this. The only thing here, it's a little bit easier, I put a lot of debug stuff in there. Because here it kind of guesses what it is. Looking at the number of fields, it looks like a plot header, or this looks like a transaction, and so it gives you the names of it. it makes it easier to read. Yeah? But this is more like an internal tool to play around it, but it really helps to understand a bit what's going on inside. Okay. Um, if you want, you can try, I mean, in the docker image. Okay. Okay. Um, maybe what, about what I would like to do next is just to show you, or not actually show you, actually, would love to, if you can do it also yourself, if to, to use it first the TypeScript client, and then maybe you can also use the C client, how to use it, how to install it. Technically, it's not very hard. Because all these things that we have seen here, are going on directly inside the client. From a developer's perspective, you just want to use it. You don't even have to care about them. The verification is just taking place, meaning you just use it. And the way you do this is it's, it's like this. Let's create a very simple um, JavaScript. I, I do it in JavaScript simply so it's even easier than TypeScript because you don't have to extra compile stuff. But the implementation is completely done in, in, a, in TypeScript. So in the uh, image itself, are all, we also download all the node modules. It's all installed, so you don't have to call npm install. But if you would start, what you usually would do, you would call npm install. And three, or if, of course you can, you can save it like this. I guess that's what everybody knows who will install the include by um, root modules. It's already done here, that's why I don't have to do it. That's why in the root modules here you already see this. Let's um, write a simple demo. The first thing you have you do is you just uh, Require in least here we would um, do it like this, and because we just take the default meaning this is the class, the include class, and now we can create a client itself. This is pretty easy and straightforward. If you do it like this, it will create a client with the defaults, but if you want, you can of course pass um, pass a lot of configuration, meaning even you can define your boot nodes that you want to use, you 
can define like the request count, how many requests do you want to send, how many signatures you want to have. And one important parameter is especially the chain ID, which chain you want to use. At the moment we have deployed on Gurley, on Coven, on the mainnet. But we will probably add it to more chains that were at least as in band. So to use it now. How do you establish that these proofs are going to the root? I'm not sure if you put further ahead. To the, the chain root. The chain root? What do you have this chain? really belongs to the chain. This block that the root. That oh, the, 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 the block belongs to the chain. Okay, yeah. The, the, the way we do this is by getting a signature from the other nodes. They need to sign that this block hash is correct. Okay. And the reason why this is. Um, this works is because this signature can, can then be passed to the smart contract itself. They can call EC Recover to make sure that's the right node, and they can also verify this, that this block hash is correct because there's an opcode, block hash opcode. At least for the last 256 blocks, you can directly in the smart contract find out if this is correct. So then we can compare, and we know either the, if this was correct what he signed, or if it was not. And if it was not, then he would lose his steps. And even for older blocks, because this was, in the beginning we had only these 256 blocks. These are the like the low hanging fruits, the easy one. But also if you want to go even further back, yeah, we created a second contract with a block hash registry, where you can uh, construct even older blocks. You need to deliver the proofs, like the, work, or the block headers, and out of these block headers, you can then prove that a certain block hash is the one for this block number. Yeah. What happens with reorgs? So in the sense of, that you have like, yeah. the nodes were not lying, but in the end they return information that is actually not true up some sometimes, right? So Exactly. Yeah, we've put a lot of thoughts into this as well. Because you're right, this is something actually that too many web developers don't think that much about finality. Then at the moment there is a configuration, like a min block height, that says how many blocks do I need to wait before I actually sign the block hash. Because one of these nodes will just get a request, please sign block number X. And then what it will do is say, is this really final? Because if it's not final, I would risk losing my deficit just because I'm on, a, on the wrong fork. I mean, at the moment, if you look at either for example, they have this, these nice stats. There were ma max three blocks, some reorgs in, a, in a, this kind of amount. But at the moment, there's a default we use for six blocks. So usually the node will not sign any block that is younger than six blocks. Yeah. So that's why if you ask for something that's younger than this, you will not get any signature. The latest block is not fine. Yeah, so, but that basically means. When I do the RPC call, I ask for latest, which, yeah. is, for, which is kind of the default, right? Like, yeah. uh, you would probably give me not the latest, but the one from latest blocks. Yeah. Right. So, so I think that this is an important thing. So nobody thinks about it, asking in full order so for the latest block. But this is also not a secure information because... So, so in here, you, you learn it with a little bit pain. If you ask for the latest block, you will never get a signature because no node will sign it. But you might get a response, just not signed. Because they don't dare to sign that you block hash, because it might be a wrong one. I mean, that's exactly what happened. We can, so you can test it. What, what's happening is that if your client will then simply say, you will retract the response because you said, I want to have two signatures.